Welcome to the Same Side Selling Podcast. For our regular listeners, I know you'll be shocked to know that this is Ian Altman, your host. <laughs> and one of the great challenges that sometimes we face in the work world, outside of work, is how do we best get along with other people? And I often hear from people in sales who say, well, this person was just impossible to get along with, or this person on my team, we just never see eye to eye. And of course, if we don't get along with people, then it inhibits our ability to be successful. And so I thought to myself, wow, if only we could tap into an expert. And I thought, well, you know what? We should get the world's leading expert on this. That person wasn't available. So instead, <laughs> what I did is yeah. I invited, invited my friend, Michael Bungay Stanier. And Michael is a guy who is probably best known for his legendary book, The Coaching Habit, which everybody I know who is an executive coach or in that coaching world that's become their standard. He's a guy who is, as a background, as a Rhodes Scholar. He's originally Australian, so if you can't understand him, it's not your fault. He now lives in Toronto, Canada, because he fell in love with a woman who is Canadian, and so we won't hold that against him either. <laughs> but with all of that, and he's a phenomenal speaker. I've been friends with Michael for years, so Michael Bungay Stonger, welcome to the show. Ian, thank you. I, I was hoping you were going to keep lowering expectations because I do really well with very, very low expectations. <laughs> but you bumped me up at the end there. But it's it's nice to be back on the show, Ian. It's nice to see you too. Well, you know, it's it's one of these things where, like I said, we were looking for the like the expert in the world. They weren't available, so we brought you on instead. And fine. of course, we're we're talking we're talking about the book, and I love the I love the title of it, of this this whole notion of how to work with almost anyone. <laughs> So what inspired you to write this book? Because obviously you've had tremendous success as an author. So yeah. why this book? You know, there, there were three catalysts behind it. The first is 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I was first introduced to this idea that if you want to build a good working relationship with somebody, you should have a conversation about that. How are we going to work together before we get into the what are we going to work on? And I've been teaching that and talking about that in various ways for 25 years. Secondly, I got to the end of my last project and I tend to roll on a project by project basis. So I'm like, what's my best guess about the next thing I should be doing? Because I'm, I'm a, one of those shiny object syndrome guys. I'm always coming up with ideas. Most of them are, are shockers, but occasionally I have a good one. And I'm like, okay, of all the ideas I've had, which one could I be working on? And the idea I had was for another book entirely. So I sat down to write that book. And then I just found myself being pulled to be writing this book, How to Work with Almost Anyone. And I think the catalyst in was, this will kind of take a bit of a sad turn. My dad died a couple of years ago. Mm. And I was actually back in Australia when my dad was dying. He'd come out of the ICU. He was living at home, but we knew he had a terminal disease. And I was home with him and with my mum. And for all the obvious reasons, they were having a tough time being together because of the, the, the situation and the stress. And what had been a really great living, loving relationship for 57 years was under pressure. And whilst trying to help out with all sorts of miscellaneous other stuff like cooking breakfast and vacuuming in the house and doing that sort of stuff, I suggested that they have a conversation about how they wanted to be together for the last weeks or months of dad's life to give them the best possible chance of ending in the best possible way. And that conversation was the kind of the real, oh, there's something really powerful here about, you know, as you said, our success, but not just our success, our happiness is so dependent on our working relationships, the people yeah. that we interact with, whether that's on your team or your boss, or your collaborator or your customer or your prospect. What if you stopped leaving it to chance and just hoping that it was going to play out well? What if you could more actively shape that to give you the chance of the best possible relationship with those other people? Yeah, you know what? I, I And I think it's so valuable, especially in today's day with people being polarized. And it's almost like That's people fine. seek how to not get along <laughs> rather than rather than trying to figure out how to get along. And right. what are the what are the most common obstacles that you see kind of the traps that people fall into that tends to derail those relationships. Yeah. You know, I, I, you could broadly put it down to life. 
because my guess is that no matter where you are on the working relationship with somebody and some relationships are up at one end of the bell curve, which are like, they're fantastic and they're shiny and they're flowing and they're wonderful. And some are in the middle, most of them perhaps, where they're like, they're solidly okay. And then you've got some down the other end where they're like, God, this is, this is sand in the gears, man. This is hard work. Even if that person isn't a sociopath, this is just a hard person to work with right now. But my rule of thumb is every working relationship is going to go off the rails a little bit at some stage. You know, it could be a, it could blow up. You know, it could be a real kind of a fight, something, a deep betrayal. But most often, it's not that. Most often, it's a, a misunderstanding, a misinterpreted comment, a, 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 a missed expectation or a misunderstood expectation. There's all sorts of ways that the fabric of our working relationships just get a little ripped and a little torn. Sure. And rather than what mostly happens is there's a, there's a degree to which this stuff just heals itself. It's self-healing just because it has to be. Like right? Time moves on and we've got to keep working together. But mostly I'm like, okay, so why don't you just, whatever's going on, why don't you make it active? Because what will derail your working relationship will depend on you and that other person. Because you've got, a, you've got a very specific and unique alchemy in how you work. Like sure. you and I were working together. You'd be going, look, Michael, I don't normally work with a man as good looking and as eloquent and as Australian as you are. I'm you've a heard me say that numerous that. times. I, I'm, 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 the, I'm normally an alpha man in this relationship. I obviously can't be the alpha male if I'm working with you. And I'm like, Ian, I'm not sure I can work with somebody who has such an exquisite taste in wine as you and is so charming and who knows so much about this and that and the other. And we kind of figure out not just what we, where we would play to each other's strengths and where we'd bring out the best in each other, but we'd also kind of have a conversation about, okay, when you're working with somebody like me and, and it drives you nuts, What's, what happens? What do they do and what do you do? And what do they say and what do you say? And I'd tell you the same. And we'd figure out what will get in the way of our relationship. And that's a much more interesting conversation than in general, what gets in the way of relationships. You know what? I, I, I love that because now it's it's down to the specifics. I know in, in one of my former businesses, when we would start a big project, I remember vividly sitting in the offices of uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois was a client of ours. And we were embarking on this major project and we're sitting in their boardroom and there's like 30 people, all these different stakeholders. Yeah. And I started the meeting and I said, so just by a show of hands, how many of you have ever been involved in a perfect project? <laughs> and no one's hands went up. Yeah. And I said, yeah, me neither. Yeah. So the first thing I want to talk about is here's the process that we should follow together. And I'm open to suggestions about how we change it so that if it looks like something's not going well, Brilliant. who to contact, how do we contact them, what type of conversations we should have so that we don't assume that anyone has an ulterior motive, but instead yeah. that we get to the root of it and try and solve it quickly. And everybody laughed and smiled. And we had this thing that said, okay, at step four, you contact me, here's my mobile number if you really think something's yeah. gonna awry. And we will get back to you within two hours with a clear plan. Now, of course, internally, our goal was within 45 minutes, we'll get back to them with a plan. But sure. to the client, it was two, within two hours, we'll get back to you. And I remember a couple months into the project, I get this phone call. I'm at step four. <laughs> I'm at step four right now. I love that. And, yeah. And we're freaked yeah. out. And I said, it's yeah. okay. What does it say next? It says you'll get back to us within two hours. I will. Half hour later, I call the guy up and say, so we got to the bottom of it. Here was the problem. Our team is yeah. working through it. And he says, well, I just found out from our team, it's something that we did on our end. I said, well, it doesn't matter who did it. The bottom <laughs> line is we're all just working towards success. They became this great reference over right. a problem that we circumvented because we proactively dealt with it. And I don't know if that's part of what you're getting at. It is. Well, I mean, there's a there's um, this parallel in in retail, which is if you have a bad experience in retail, mm -hmm. but the company does a brilliant job at fixing the problem, you become much more loyal and you become a much louder advocate for that. Yeah. So perversely, if you're in retail, you should actually be trying to make a minus, you should schedule a minor screw up, one that you know that you can crush in terms of fixing it, because that's how you win champions. Nobody talks about it's being fine the whole time. But if they go, they did this, but then they did that, then yeah. they become champions for you. And you're saying something similar there. 
And I think this is true, which is if you are able to have a hiccup in the working relationship and you've got a way of fixing it, repairing it, it not only takes you back to where you were, it takes you further because you're like, that could have gone two ways. We're at a crossroads. That could have gone dark, but we move towards the light. That shows a deeper commitment to who they are, who they say they are, how they want to be with us. And that only promises good things for the long, long-standing relationship. Awesome. So you talk in the book about, and by the way, I love the book. I love that you've got like worksheets at the end of each chapter. People can actually put these ideas to work. They're, you, know, you can scan a QR code, get additional resources. It's you not I, like- we're, we're practical, you and me. You know, we're yeah. like, we're, we're not just giving you ideas. We want to show you how to do these ideas. So I think you and I are pretty simpatico like that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I just think you do it better. And so the, and the, the idea though, is that, you, you raised this concept of the best possible relationship. Yeah. So tell me about that concept. Sure. So not every relationship can be fantastic. You know, it'd be nice if it was. It's nice if every relationship was roses and unicorns and rainbows and the whole lot, glasses of wine or whatever it might be. But you look, every working relationship has potential. So how do you fulfill its potential? How do you make it the best possible version of that working relationship? And I reckon there are three attributes to it. It needs to be safe, it needs to be vital, and it needs to be repairable. So mm-hmm. safe is language that we've all become familiar with. You know, Amy Edmondson 10 years ago became the kind of the OG around psychological safety. And lots of people will know the research from Google, Project Oxygen, Project Aristotle about what makes teams flourish and key elements and all of that are psychological safety. But for me, psychological safety isn't enough. It needs to be more than just something that's safe. I want working relationships that help me grow and help me stretch and challenge me and provoke me. So vital is about psychological bravery. And you want to find that balance because you can imagine and you probably experience relationships that are all safe and no edge. And I'm like, I feel, I feel very protected <laughs> and I feel slightly bored. And you probably had working relationships, I know I have, where I'm like, it's all edge and there's no safety here. So when I fall, I fall hard and it is, it is brutal. And I'm trying to find that mix. And it's different every time I have a conversation with somebody, right? What's our mix of psychological safety and psychological bravery, bravery yeah. safe and vital? But then in, as part of the research around this, I was reading deeply into those people who are true experts about how relationships work. So Esther Perel and Terry Real and, um, you know, five love languages and uh, John Gottman, all these people who spent a lifetime studying actual longstanding romantic relationships. And they came up with two key insights. One is the relationships that last are the ones that get repaired. And yep. we're, not that, we're not that good at repairing relationships. Like what you did with that team, which is when things go wrong, how will we fix it? Here's a process. That is a rare conversation. Everybody yeah. laughed in that room because they're like, <laughs> wow, nobody's ever kind of said that before. And the brilliance of what you did, Ian, was you, it says things will go wrong. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a if, it's a when. How will we fix it when things go wrong? And that's such a powerful commitment to the future state of the work of the working relationship. So best possible relationship, safe, vital, and repairable. Got it. Got it. And then, and then I love, I love this, this other concept you share, this idea of the keystone, which you describe it in the book. It's something I've, I've studied in the past, which is, you know, that the keystone is the area where when two arches come together, the keystone is what keeps everything intact. If it's not there, then the arches collapse and, and there's, you got mayhem and like it's yeah. <laughs> total destruction. Yeah. And, and you talk about this idea of this keystone conversation and five different questions to ask. Yeah. Uh, you talk about how to do it, not only asking it of yourself, but then collaboratively. So walk people through that. And oh. what I want to do is have a lens towards relationships that people in sales might have with their clients. Yeah. That someone that a sales manager might have with their team or their team, a team member might have with their manager or different people. Cause I think that too often when people talk about this, it's, Oh, here's me and my coworker, but it doesn't have to be somebody who is your coworker or co-employee. Right. It could be somebody who works for another company. Indeed. Yeah. That's a really good insight, Ian. I mean, I think if you think about just as we said at the start, if who, who, which relationships influence your success and your happiness, 
you quickly discover that it's some of the people on your team and it's probably your boss and it might be some other co-collaborators across the company and it might be some on-standing clients that you have if you're responsible for client management and it might be some of those key sales conversations particularly if you're in one of those long sales cycles where you're like this isn't just a, i'm taking your order this is more of a yeah. conversation around like that any key converse, uh, relationship one that you think will drive success and happiness you're like maybe this could be useful for that. Yep. And the idea is you are having a conversation about how do we bring out each other's best? That's it. How do we bring out each other's best? Which also means how do we avoid each other's worst? Yeah. So the first conversation is what is your best? What's your best? When do you shine and when do you flow? I think this is particularly yep. helpful for people who you're working with closely. So perhaps people yeah. on your team, you're like, Ian, I've already made up a whole bunch of stuff about you and who you are and what I think you like, but why don't you tell me when you're at your best about the work you love to do about the way you work with people that is at your best and just sort of inherent values about how you see the world and what matters to you. Yeah. Why don't I tell you the same? The second question is the steady question and it's what are your practices and your preferences? because we've all got these little habits of how we work. It's the mechanics and the logistics of how we work. And they all seem pretty straightforward to us, but they're all slightly weird to other people. And getting that slightly wrong can be one of those little sources of irritation that can just drive you nuts. Well, I mean, and, and I, and Michael, let me interrupt for a second. I, I think the notion of this is really comes down to much of expectation management. And right. and I've got ideas on how all this ties into sales as well. But this notion of what, do you, what are my practices and preferences and what are yours, it could be a matter of saying, for example, to a potential client, here's what we have found has worked best and here's the process that we follow. Explain to me how we might need to adapt that for your organization. Yeah. And yeah. now they're saying, oh, well, if that's the way it works best, maybe we should probably just follow your process. Right. But it's not just, here's what we want to do so we can manipulate you. If right. you can show them why it's in their best interest, they'll probably follow along. And even the notion of this amplify question of what's your best, it's a matter of, I always tell my clients, focus on the people you can help the most. Focus on right. solving the problems that you're best at solving. Yeah. Don't just do stuff that you could do. And this that. is what's led to companies that we've helped grow from 100 million to 700 million and companies from 15 million to 100 million because they actually get rid of the people who aren't the best fit. And yep. now anybody who is a good fit, they just become the natural. So yeah. so I, I see I Love see that. a great yeah, correlation between those. Now let me get let me let me get you to, let me let you get to the next <laughs> three questions. But yeah. Questions three and four, yeah. the good date and the bad date questions. And I think this is really helpful for salespeople, particularly in relationship with potential prospects or, or clients. Here's what is true. Patterns from the past will repeat again in the future. So why don't you look to the past and figure out what good looks like and what not good looks like and communicate it to them. So when you sit down with somebody, you're like, let me tell you about a really great sales relationship I've had. And when it really was great for both of us and here's what they did and here's what I did and here's what they said and here's what I said and yeah. didn't say and didn't do. Let me tell you what the very best type of working relationship is for me. And why don't you tell me your best working relationships with somebody like me? Yeah. And now you do the same for like the bad ones because they will have bad stories about bad working relationships with salespeople. Trust yeah. me on that. They're like, here's what drives me nuts about everything and you're like this is such good news yeah because it allows you to go right so let's do more of the stuff that is a good working relationship and let's avoid as much of the stuff that is bad working relationship as possible yep so love it you just find this way of having this alliance where you're like let's talk about how we want to work together but there's a kind of a, an added benefit to all of this in which is not only do you get answers in the moment which are really helpful to help you navigate this so you don't screw it up and you get a chance to amplify what's best but it allows you to keep checking in with each other to go how's it going how's this working for you are we yeah. are we kind of still on track does this feel right for you have we accidentally wandered off the path a little bit and we need to kind of find our way back yep and that's the fifth question which we've already kind of touched on which is the repair question how will we fix it when things go wrong and i think your story right at the start of the conversation was so spot on around that yeah well and and I want to I want to tie this back for 
for our audience to the sales side? Because the notion of first the amplify question, focusing on what's your best and how do you best work with people? And then what are your practices and preferences and finding that out from the client. Now we're having this dialogue about here's who we best serve. And here's, right. here's, here's where we deliver the best for clients. How does that align with what you're looking for? And getting them to say, Oh yeah, that's pretty well aligned. Okay. And, and here's the way we tend to accomplish that. How does yeah. that fit? The good date, bad date. It's interesting because we actually teach people in a competitive environment if they already have an existing vendor, what we ask them is, so you're working with this vendor for the last few years. What are the two or three things that maybe we should emulate that maybe we don't do, we should be doing nice. that would, would help us to excel in our field? And then they'll tell you that. And then we don't even, even ask them <laughs> what's bad about them. We just say, so if you could change one or two things, what would those be? Nice. And then all of a sudden they, they start identifying the stuff that the existing vendor doesn't do. And you go, oh, is the potential of solving those worth a discussion about how we might be able to help? And all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, why am I working with the same vendor? So, yeah. so all, the, all these questions, I mean, yeah. it, it's funny because as I was reading the book, I'm like, yeah, Michael and I are even more aligned than I originally thought on some of these. And I just think that for, for well, people look, in the same side selling world, yeah. this I mean, is just it, a really dovetails nicely. It's in the title, same side selling. What you're doing here is you're getting over to the same side of each other because you're saying to each other, let's build a relationship that brings out the best of both of us. Yeah. So it's a deep commitment to make selling non-adversarial, but you know, a partnership. And this is a conversation to say, here's how you might think about finding ways into building relationships, building partnerships with uh, prospects. Yeah. And I just, I, it's just such a, it's such a powerful and timely piece because as we said at the beginning, I think that too often people either build a narrative in their mind about what they believe. In some cases nowadays, it can be politically driven. It's like, oh, this person believes this politically, which means they also believe X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Right. And it's kind of funny because there, there was, there was um, we were at a wedding recently and my kids were at a table with some of their cousins. And one of my, one of my cousins said to, said to um, I think it was our son, said, well, I mean, I know your dad is like a high performance person. So, you know, for me, it's really important that I enjoy what I'm doing. And he would probably disagree. My son said, actually, he would agree 100%. Like, he would agree you should never do stuff that you don't enjoy. You should find what you enjoy and do it really well and thrive. Yeah. You shouldn't be lazy. But the whole purpose of doing all this work is to enjoy time with your family and things right. that are important to you. And they're like, yeah. really? It's like, <laughs> yeah. How do you not know this about your uncle? I mean, but, we, we we make up a lot of stuff very quickly about other yeah. people. Just as you're saying, we do a whole lot of projection. And just as you're saying, Ian, I think in, you know, it's a cliche now to say we're in more rather than less polarized world at the moment where yeah. you're like, I'm boxing you, I'm labeling you, I'm deciding who you are and what you care about and what you don't care about. And this is a conversation to say, look, even if we are on, say, different political sides, if that's the thing that's polarizing you, how do we still get the best possible relationship knowing all of that might be true? Yeah, exactly. And it's just a matter of, I, I think it's that notion of finding that common ground, yep. not necessarily on issues, but more, if I understand your perspective, you understand my perspective, we can respect those perspectives and see how right. we work together or not. Or we might say, you know what? Hey, so-and-so on our team, you two should work together. You'd work great together. <laughs> I'm going to be, you know, we're going to be oil and water. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it's like we are oil and water and we have to work together. So how do we do that? <laughs> and exactly. the conversation goes, right. So let's try and avoid this as much as possible because we both know that's going to drive each other nuts. And let's try and double down on this area here because there we've got some common ground and it looks like the place we're going to thrive best. So, yeah, I, I mean, the, the obvious place people go is like, how do I build brilliant working relationships? And I hope that's true with this book. But I also think if you can improve the, the, the hardest five working relationships you have and, and move them from almost unworkable to be good enough, to be workable enough, that is a huge win for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's funny. I think that the more we focus on results and outcomes, the better. It's fascinating because people say to me that, like, you know, in our same site selling academy, we have better than 95% renewal rate. And people say, well, 
you know, what's the secret? Is it, do you have this type of campaign, that type of campaign? I said, we're relentlessly focused on people's results. Yeah. And the yeah. people who double their business, the people who shorten their sales cycles, people who make higher margins, people who make more money working less, they tend to want to come back. <laughs> yeah, no, I right? this, this investment seems to be paying off nicely. Yeah. yeah, it works out okay. So Michael, what's the best way for people to pick up how to work with almost anyone well, and, the um, and to connect with you? Yeah, the book's everywhere. But if you want the bonuses that you'll find in the book, and the bonuses are free, bestpossiblerelationship.com is the URL for that. You actually see me filming and, and videoing a Keystone conversation. So you see me and a, a colleague working through the five questions. And there's downloads of worksheets and the five questions and all the other good sorts of stuff. If you want more about me in general, mbs.works is the website there. And that's a hub to social media and all of that other stuff. Yeah. Perfect. And um, and I encourage everybody, reach out to Michael. I've known Michael for years. When he comes to town, we may occasionally open a bottle of wine. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and I, it just every time I talk to you, I'm like, I've got to get down and see you more often because <laughs> if I'm going to open a bottle of wine with anybody, it's going to be with Ian Altman. You know what? I appreciate that. So thanks so much for sharing your wisdom. Um, let me give a quick recap to our audience of the key takeaways that I think they should they should focus on. Um, so the, the first part is that let's if we're seeking that best possible relationship, obviously we want to make sure that it has those three elements of safe, vital, and repairable. And it's a collaborative process that gets us on the same side with them. The Beautiful. Keystone conversation has these five elements to it. It has the amplify question, which is helping you and the other party focus on what's your best. The steady piece, which is understanding each other's practices and preferences understanding the good date and the bad date, namely, what can you each learn from successful and frustrating past relationships? And then finally, how will you fix things when it's going wrong? And if you go to bestpossiblerelationships.com, that's it, right? Yep. Then you can get all the bonuses, get the access. I've really enjoyed the book. And uh, Michael, is there anything, any key thing that I left out in the summary? Honestly, I should be interviewing you about the book. You do it better than I do. I've clearly made a mistake being the guest here. I just need to flip the tables. All right, perfect. We'll record it again in a minute. <laughs> All right, Michael, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Ian.